it's all um, yours. Thank you uh, very much, um, Cheryl. Thank you for the kind introduction. And uh, thank you, Liz, for inviting me and uh, Gary for uh, being our Zoom jockey. Um, I would invite, although Gary kindly advised you if you don't want to be on the recording to turn your camera off, if you are comfortable turning it on, at least to just wave for a minute. For those of us who speak, it's always nice to see people's faces. And if you're eating breakfast and don't want to you know, let us see you eat, then maybe just if you're comfortable turning on for a moment and, and waving hello. Um, and uh, I'm really delighted to um, have a chance to um, speak to Arlington Neighborhood Village. Uh, I have a friend who's part of the group, uh, Michael Raisin, who put me in touch with Liz. And my next door neighbor, Chun Yi Chang, and his wife, Emily Chang, are also members. So um, I've been adjacent to Arlington Neighborhood Village, and uh, everything that I've heard about it is um, is wonderful. And one of the things Cheryl and I were discussing before the event began formally is that um, as climate change becomes more severe, we're all seeing more and more extreme weather events, which I'll say something more about in a moment, is that the research shows really one of the best things we can do to protect ourselves against extreme weather. Uh, it's not necessarily having extra water or food or sandbags. It's knowing your neighbors and having social networks. And so I think what um, ANV does in uh, strengthening the social fabric of Arlington and having neighbors who help each other is um, really valuable. So um, onto my book. Um, I was born in 1954, so I'm exactly in the middle of the baby boom generation. I know not everybody here is a boomer. The boomers uh, were the, as I think everybody here knows, the post-war baby boom. The GIs came home from the war, they married their girlfriends, and they started having babies. And the birth rate shot up in 1946, and it stayed very high, an average of three to four children per family until 1963 when two things happened. One is you got a crop of younger women coming into the marriage market who didn't necessarily see themselves as being moms first and foremost. They had other ambitions. The other thing was the pill. So the birth rate dropped very quickly. And that cohort of the boomers then as we aged really shaped American society. We were the, the first ones in the new suburbs, uh, many of you here maybe went to a brand new school, um, as I did, the first ones with TVs, um, and the culture really tracked us over time. Um, because our generation is so big and so dominant, the culture and the corporations selling things really chased after us. So even if you're a little bit Pre-boomer, maybe born before 1946, or post-boomer, born after 1963, you're still boomer adjacent. And the messages of my book, I think, pertain um, to everybody who's on this call. The book has two parts. The first is, how did we get here? And I think the book is unique in that Climate change is an intergenerational and a global problem. And there are many, many books about it. And there are lots of books about baby boomers, but I'm the only one to look at climate change specifically through a generational lens. And what I show is that our generation had very high ideals. Does anybody here remember the first Earth Day? Put a little yes in the chat or raise your hand if you remember the first Earth Day. I see Carolyn remembers the first Earth Day. I remember the first Earth Day. I think I was about 14 or 15. Um, and that boomers turned out in the millions for that. And as many of you will remember, it drove a huge wave of environmental legislation passed with a bipartisan consensus and those are the only environmental laws we have. We haven't had any real environmental legislation since then. That's why it's now being challenged um, in the Supreme Court with backing from the fossil fuel companies and other vested polluting industries who want to undo it. Um, we were also um, active in supporting the civil rights movement. Um, we were very active in the um, women's rights movement, later in the LGBT movement. But when it came to climate change, my generation dropped the ball. And we dropped the ball for 
two reasons. First, well, maybe three. We were busy. We were at a stage of our lives in our 30s where we were marrying, buying houses, building our careers, having children. We were past that protesting stage of our life. The other thing, and many of you will remember this, is that the fossil fuel companies lied. This has come out now in research, but I can remember seeing in the New York Times, is the earth warming or is the earth cooling? Some scientists think this, some scientists think that. That was all, excuse my French, total bullshit and lies. The science has been very, very clear, but the fossil fuel companies using a playbook from the tobacco companies said our business is doubt. As long as people aren't sure it's happening or aren't sure it's human caused or think it's far away, they won't act on it. And the third reason is something to do with our boomer culture. Does anybody remember the slogan, don't trust anybody over 30? I see a few heads nodding. Um, does anybody remember the slogan, be here now? Baba Ram Das it was a Zen idea. It was a rebellion against our parents and their propensity to want to save and delay gratification. And a slogan I remember from junior high school, a kid had a button that said, if it feels good, do it. I thought that sounds good. So we were very much sort of based on, uh, we, we exalted uh, intuition and enjoyment of the moment. And those are good things, but that also doesn't lend itself well to caring about what happens in the future. So for various reasons, we dropped the ball. That's the first part of my book, but we still have a lot of power. There's 70 million boomers. Um, we have 70% of the country's wealth. We vote in much larger numbers than other generations. And despite the fact that the majority of boomers voted for Donald Trump, not once, but twice, a large majority of us believe that climate change is a problem. So the main thing is that we are not, those of us who are concerned are not doing enough. And um, I wanna take a moment here just very briefly um, to share my screen. Um, that's the book. I hope if you're interested in it, you will buy it. Um, I see Liz has put the link to the Amazon site um, in the chat. We'll put that up again later. But the reason I wanted to share my screen is to show you this chart. Has anybody seen this chart or a similar chart like it before? I want you to take a moment to study it because it's telling us a lot about what has happened in the last nine to 12 months and what's going to happen. The little gray squiggly lines, there is one line for each year. And you can see that uh, it starts in January and it goes till December. No surprise there, the earth gets warmer uh, in the summer. Uh, this is the global average surface temperature. And although our summer is the uh, winter in the South because most of the land is in the North, this is actually the global average temperature. And so each year, because the planet has been warming, the um, the little squiggly gray lines go up and up and up. And you can see there's kind of a mass of them. And then there's those dotted lines and those are for um, various decades, um, 79, 81 and 91. And each one is higher, but they're getting higher in a kind of a regular pattern. But if you look at the yellow line around June, the yellow line is 2023, you see something remarkable happens. The line breaks out of that gray mass. That means that the average surface global temperature is anywhere from, uh, these are Celsius, so anywhere from one degree Fahrenheit to two degrees Fahrenheit above anything that has ever happened before. And then if you look at the line for 2024, I haven't grabbed the latest one, but this trend is continued. We also started out well above, almost a full degree centigrade above where we were in 23. The climate scientists don't know why this is. What we do know is that the climate science has consistently lagged. You hear climate deniers saying, well, we are not so sure about the science. For the last 30 years, climate scientists have consistently under predicted the speed and the magnitude of the change. And now we're having this breakout event 
And we saw it here in Washington, D.C. Springs had been getting earlier by a few days, maybe a week, maybe two. This year, spring came three weeks early. Um, you've seen this. If you garden, you know that everything is, is way, way early this year. So um, I don't want to frighten people, but we're all grownups here. And I, I want you to take this on board and also talk to your friends about it. And um, I'll make sure that I share the links to this slide. I think that this is a possibly, you know, one of the most important charts in, in terms of civilization. And it does mean that we are going to be in for many more extreme uh, weather events, um, like the fires that um, happened in Chile uh, not long ago, the um, floods in Los Angeles. Um, I won't um, belabor those kinds of things. We all see them. We all know that they're happening. So, Unless you're a full-time person paying attention to the climate scientists, it's probably significantly worse than you thought. That's my first key takeaway. The second part of my book, really the last two thirds is what are we going to do about it? And um, I start with personal action because everybody wants to talk about personal action. Somebody on the call mentioned recycling, you know, getting an EV, putting solar on your roof. I'm happy to talk about those, but my main point about personal action is don't get stuck there. The fossil fuel companies invented the idea of personal carbon footprint. We all know this. The Washington Post has a full-time columnist writing climate coach. It's all about personal change. It's not about personal change. It needs collective action to force policy change and particularly to challenge the fossil fuel companies because fossil fuels are the main source of the earth heating pollution that is heating the planet. And we need a very rapid transition away from fossil fuels. Fortunately, we've got the technology. Renewables are now cheaper than fossil fuels. There's some small things that have to be worked out in terms of the transition, but the basic technology is there. What we don't have is the political will. So the rest of my book includes chapters on um, how can I work with others? What's faith got to do with it based on um, faith-based climate advocacy? Um, a chapter on civil disobedience called um, Should I Get Arrested? And I'm happy to talk about civil disobedience if anybody would like to do that. And I would say that you know, it's really a guidebook. So it's a little bit of self-help and a little bit like a guide, just like if you're making a trip to Italy, you get the guidebook. You don't plan to do everything, but you look at it and you pick the things that you want to do. And so for each chapter, I have a, uh, it begins with a question and then it's got the answer. So for what's faith got to do with it, the answer is, so it's like a Cliff Notes test. Those of us remember Cliff Notes. All religious traditions require we protect the planet and care for the poor. Top faith leaders are urging action. Faith-based advocacy can be a source of power when religious groups demand action, politicians listen. And then each chapter ends with a, an action checklist. So uh, for example, on the faith-based chapter, and there's not only faith in this book, but I've chosen this chapter, in the um, the checklist at the bottom here, uh, learn about faith-based teachings on climate, tap national organizations for advice and support, join in faith-based advocacy, encourage your clergy and other faith leaders to speak out and explore interfaith action. So this is a manual. Um, I hope that people will um, find it useful. Um, I include a chapter on the importance of the radical flank, and I'll say just a couple words about that and then um, encourage questions. If you have a question, please put it in the chat, or um, I think Gary will um, call upon you, and you can, um, we're not very many people here, you know, uh, go ahead and, and speak to me directly. Um, if we look at history, I want to talk about the radical flank. Some people find the word radical frightening. It's not the same as extreme. Um, the people who stormed the Capitol on January 6th are extremists. They weren't radicals um, in that they weren't looking to fundamentally 
change things. The word radical has to do with going to the root of the problem. And if we look at the social justice movements that we admire, like the uh, movement to ensure women the right to vote, the suffragettes, um, if we look at the civil rights um, movement, if we look at the movement for um, HIV AIDS treatment, they all had a radical flank that was willing to disrupt business as usual. And you get two things from those disruptions. You get attention, people start talking about the issue, which is something that we all need to be doing. And you make space for the more moderate groups. So when Dr. King was negotiating with Johnson and the white politicians in Congress to pass the Civil Rights Act, everybody knew there was a group called the Black Panthers. And they thought we better deal with King because if we don't, we're gonna have the Black Panthers to deal with. The climate movement, I think, has been too polite. We don't have a large enough, strong enough, radical flank to cause people to say, I guess we better pay attention to all those nice climate people who are marching and carrying signs, because if we don't, we're going to have these more radical people that we have to deal with. So um, I believe we need, given the, the chart that I showed you, the time has come for a stronger radical flank. And that doesn't necessarily mean that those of us who support the radical flank need to risk arrest or um, put ourselves in danger. Every radical flank has a group of people who support them by contributing money, by looking after people's children, uh, by cooking food, doing the kinds of things that people in Arlington Neighborhood Village are good at. And so I would encourage us as elders to think about um, paying attention to what's going on in the radical flank, if we're comfortable um, supporting them financially, because we really need people that are sounding the alarm. So that's me. I see there are questions coming in. I haven't had a chance to read any of them since I've been talking. So maybe I'll pause here, Gary, and um, let you um, lift up whatever question you think I should uh, go with first. All right, well, um, one is, touches on something you've already mentioned that large corporations promoted the idea that solving climate change was the responsibility of us rather than something the industries needed to do. The question is how much has that astroturfing affected the movement to mitigate climate change? Um, I see that question came from Liz. I think it's incredibly important, Liz. I think that the um, the idea that it is up to each of us to do our little bit and that's somehow going to add up to change has been a huge distraction and continues to be a, a big distraction. Um, I mentioned to somebody before the call that um, I belong to Temple Road of Shalom. I have a friend there who's a very progressive person, probably like a lot of this on the call. She understands climate change is an issue. As we were leaving the synagogue one day, she said to me, you know, I'd like to be a climate activist, but I really can't because I'm still driving a gasoline car. I said, Stephanie, that's exactly what they want you to think. You mustn't think that. None of us is perfect. I've done the six things that um, I describe in the chapter on personal action. I've got an EV. I installed solar. I pretty much stopped eating meat. I stopped wasting food. Um, I feel good about those things. It helps, but it's not gonna solve the problem. And this uh, focus on individual action has been um, not only for us individually, but for many, many environmental groups and groups like the Washington Post. The Washington Post badly needs a climate weekly climate column. It should not be called Climate Coach because Climate Coach suggests that we need individual coaches. So we keep tuning up our personal behavior to make it better. And I, so yes, Liz, thank you for the question. I think it's a big problem. Are you raising your hand? Yeah. Um, one thing I wanted to add is I know a lot of people who really are turned off by the climate movement because it's going to take away all their fun. And the whole climate coach idea plays into that idea of this is about 
taking things away from you. Yes, yes. And Rebecca um, Solnit, uh, one of the great uh, writers and activists on climate, uh, her new book, um, It's Not Too Late, she says, you know, what if um, responding to the climate emergency meant not scarcity, but abundance? Many of the things that we want in our lives um, don't require a lot of energy production. In fact, um, lots of energy consumption doesn't necessarily make our lives better. We all need a minimum level of energy, but you know that second refrigerator, your life is probably easier if you're not worrying about two refrigerators. You know, there's a lot we can do. Walking, you know, walking is going to give us joy. Uh, and if the streets become safer and we collectively can make the street safer and more walkable, we'll have better lives. So. There's a lot of things that, that we can do as we respond to the climate emergency that will make our lives better, not worse. Absolutely. Now, earlier you said uh, we have the, a lot of the technologies to move away from fossil fuels. And there's a comment here that uh, electrical energy storage is still something of a challenge. Are you aware of any recent developments in that area that are going to make that more practical and easier to do? Yes, was this the question from Pat that talks about EVs as a double-edged sword? No, this was the question from Steve. <laughs> Are there other reasons? Oh, no, I'm sorry, I'm seeing, seeing Steve's it's questions said, about the camera. Yeah, um, he's, electrical energy storage is still a technological challenge. Yeah, Steve, thank you for that question. I discussed this um, a bit in the book. Um, the short answer is energy storage is an issue, but it's advancing very quickly. Um, I heard today on the radio a proposal for a, a pumped water storage in Arizona, where they are proposing to use solar during the day to pump water up to a reservoir and it will then flow down at night. That's not a new technology, but as we have more and more solar and the solar gets cheaper and cheaper, that's a technology that is going to be in some places um, possibly viable. The other thing is that um, battery technology is advancing very rapidly. The new um, EVs, the batteries are lasting longer than people expected. Uh, we don't know. We've never had these batteries out there. Because they are large, and they contain a lot of minerals, they're gonna be very um, readily recyclable. It's gonna make economic sense to send them to a central facility, take them apart and recycle those minerals. The other thing that can happen with the car batteries is say they fall to 70 or even 50% of their capacity. So instead of taking you 200 miles that take you hundred miles, people might say, I don't really want this in my car anymore. They can be great um, home backup batteries. So there are a lot of things with the existing technology and then there is rapid technological progress. So I think it's like other things, you know, we didn't have a vaccine for COVID when it began and then we made a major push and we got a vaccine. And uh, with, with government investment, private sector investment, I think that problem is getting solved. Okay, the next question, uh... Would it be possible for government to require fossil fuel companies to have EV <coughs> charging capacity at every gas station? Who is that from? That's from Liz. I love your questions, Liz. Um, there was a story, maybe you saw it in the post, about the slow rollout of the charging stations. And I thought the same thing. Why didn't they... You wouldn't even have to require it necessarily. You would just have to, you know, create some incentives. They, they've got the infrastructure. They're in all the right places. I don't know why we haven't focused the charging stations at the gas stations. Also, these people are going to be going out of business. They've all got little convenience stores. I would think that many of the franchise owners would be happy to do it. I think the problem is the political power of the fossil fuel companies, they don't want to normalize EVs. They're fighting EVs every step of the way. And so it would need a sophisticated strategy that would appeal to the franchisees. Most of these gas stations are franchises. 
that would give them some subsidy for installing it. And then they could go ahead and put it in. So I think it's a brilliant idea. I haven't seen it discussed anywhere. So you and me both, Liz, we think that that's where they ought to put the chargers. So we've got a couple of additional questions on EVs. <clears throat> One of them uh, is pointing out, aren't electric vehicles something of a double-edged sword? Meaning, you know, you're not burning gas, but you're drawing power from uh, power plants that produce greenhouse gases. So, you know, is it a net positive or given all the the mining and everything else that goes into producing EVs and the batteries and all that, you know, what's the, the bottom line here? Yeah, there are really two pieces to that question. The first one has to do with the source of the energy. And I worried about that before I bought my car. And a simple way to think about it is that first, EVs are much, much more energy efficient than gasoline cars. And they don't have any tailpipe exhaust, so they're not bringing pollution into the neighborhoods where we live. So even if you have a very highly fossil fuel dependent grid, it's probably not 100% fossil. I think here in um, Virginia, if I remember, we're right, right around 50% uh, fossil. The rest is um, hydrogen, nuclear, and renewables. I could be off, but it's, it's of the nature of a 40-60 split, roughly. That means that a significant share of your en energy is not from fossil fuels. And once you buy the EV, the grid is getting cleaner every time we shut down a coal plant and bring on more renewables, uh, the grid gets cleaner. So your car automatically gets cleaner without you doing anything. Um, whereas if you have a gasoline car, it's not going to get cleaner at all. You're burning gas even as the grid gets um, cleaner. Um, the question about the minerals is a an important one and a difficult one. There are very serious human rights violations, especially in the Congo with the mining of these minerals. Um, the difference is, and those should be solved and the corporations that are buying the minerals should play a key role in that. The difference is that if we can manage the problem of the mining, the environmental problems, then we have a truly renewable source of energy. Whereas fossil fuels, there's a lot of human rights involved in, uh, violations in fossil fuels as well. If you look at the Niger Delta, terrible pollution problems um, in Ecuador, the destruction of the Amazon rainforest, um, people being moved off their lands here in the United States, the, um, the asthma and uh, emphysema and cancer associated with people who live adjacent to fossil fuel plants. All of that's built in and you get climate change. So um, the renewables and the batteries, they're not a perfect solution, but they are manageable problems. Whereas fossil fuels, no matter how you cut it, they're extremely destructive. And if we come back to that chart I showed with the temperature shooting off the charts, we have to find a way to solve the problems. And so when we're thinking about this, the fossil fuel companies, the reason we're asking these questions, well, what about the minerals? And what about this? It's because the fossil fuel companies are saying that all the time. And they've got one of our presidential candidates campaigning against EVs and spreading these ideas. So I think it's, it's useful for us to, Think about this, and I explain some of that in my book as well. I'll stop there. Okay. Um, you talked a bit about the radical flank, and we've got a couple of related questions. One of them is, how do we find these people? Who are they? And the second one, the, they also asked, what groups are considered most effective and not so extreme as to be detrimental to the cause? So... You know, who is the radical flank and, and how do we get to them? Who, who, who asked that? I love the question so much and I can't keep track of the chat. Who said, who, oh. who, how do we find the radical flank? That was Steve. Thank you, Steve. And, and then the related question is, you know, what are some groups? Let me mention uh, a book that I recommend um, really highly by a woman named Dana Fisher. And uh, I've got it here. I'll find the title in a moment, but um, let me share with you her main thesis. She is a uh, she's also local. Um, she's a sociologist who has studied uh, the climate movement, and one of the things she shows is that the 
these disruptive actions, and I'll tell you in a minute who does them so you can find them, these disruptive actions are often not popular. People say, I don't like this, but then ironically, it increases support for more moderate movements. So not only do the moderate movements get some political space, but some people will say, oh, I really don't like it when they you know, throw paint on the Van Gogh, which actually happened, you know, the Van Gogh was covered with glass, no art was damaged, or here in Washington, D.C., where they put finger paint on the, the case of the Degas. Again, no, no art was damaged. I don't love those actions, but I also don't criticize them because I figure if somebody wants to do something to get us talking about this, if I've got a better idea, I'll do that other thing. So those things, people don't like them. But then they decide, you know, I guess maybe I should do something. So as to um, where to find them, a good introduction to this is, uh, and I can put this in the chat, uh, there's a, a foundation called the Climate Emergency Fund. And I don't know, Liz, if you were being um, jockey for us, if you Google Climate Emergency Fund and put it in the chat, that might be very nice. And um, a woman named Margaret Klein Solomon, again, a local academic, I think she's in Baltimore, has written a book about confronting the climate emergency. She raises money that she gives to disruptive groups. And the two disruptive groups I'm most familiar with are a youth-led group called Climate Defiance um, and another group, which is uh, international, called Extinction Rebellion. And if, if you look for either of them, you'll find uh, plenty of information. They tend to communicate through social media. Climate Defiance still uses the platform that used to be called Twitter uh, and Extinction Rebellion. I think mostly, I'm not sure, they mostly go for mainstream media. Um, just a, two flavors of this. I prefer climate defiance because they don't go after art. They don't block roads. They go after politicians who are apologists for the fossil fuels. Now, as an older person, I'm not very comfortable with random use of the F-bomb. They use it a lot. It's not my group. They're young people, um, and they use quite shocking language. But they do find people who are people like Senator Joe Manchin, who are doing the dirty work of the fossil fuel companies, and they confront him face to face. And I think that that helps people to understand the nature of the fossil fuels political power. Extinction Rebellion does things like throwing paint on artwork and blocking roads. I think that's one step removed from the problem. I don't find it um, as useful, but again, I don't criticize um, anybody. So I think those are two groups to to take a look at. And climate defiance is, I, I know from personal experience, they're happy to welcome older people like me. I support them financially and I have participated um, in their actions. Uh, one of the nice things about their actions is they always leave before the police arrive so nobody gets arrested. Um, I've been arrested four times. I'm happy to talk about civil disobedience. Um, for us as older people, Third Act, founded by Bill McKibben, is a uh, a great organization, and uh, it's not part of the radical flank, but among compared to say the Sierra Club, and uh, my former employer, World Resources Institute, um, thirdact.org, is a very comfortable place for retired people who want to engage in climate advocacy. All right. Uh, next question is, have partnerships between older adults and members of younger generations to address climate change concerns been very effective? Who is that from, Gary? That's from Cheryl. Um, Cheryl, um, yes. Partnerships between old and young are wonderful. Um, I will, in a minute, put in the chat uh, an article I wrote showing that when you look at the level of concern across generations, which I think the sociologists call this bimodal, but you see that among the millennials, it's very high. Then it dips down for people in their 30s and 40s, and that comes up again for people like us. So our generation, older Americans, older voters, is the second highest level of concern. 
And you see this when you go to um, climate protests, it's often the young and the old together. And um, in third act, and anybody who's interested in third act, I'm happy to talk to you and invite you to join us. We have capitalized on that by developing something we call the rocking chair rebellion. Did anybody here see any, has anybody seen that word rocking chair rebellion, seen the story in the New York Times? So um, last year we organized a set of protests outside the big banks that are lending to fossil fuel companies, demanding that they stop financing new fossil fuel infrastructure. And we organized about 50 rocking chairs. We had a big party, we painted them bright colors, and then we carried them to the banks and we did a 24 hour vigil um, with the uh, rocking chairs in front of the banks. And since then, we often bring them to youth-led um, events. Uh, they'll reach out to us and say, could you all bring some older folks in some rocking chairs? And we're like, sure, <laughs> we will. And um, I'll tell you something fun about the rocking chairs. First, they make a great visual. It's like old people are here. And even if you're not the kind of old person who needs a rocking chair, it's pretty nice to have one to sit in. I've noticed whenever we bring rocking chairs, they get occupied, uh, including by young people. Sometimes these um, protests go on for an hour or two. It's very good to have a place to sit. Um, so the symbolism is nice. The rocking chairs are fun. I've got four of them in my backyard up in the gazebo. They're scattered around the DC area. And uh, whenever the young people have a protest, um, we, uh, if we're invited, we bring along rocking chairs. Um, in fact, there will be one on April 21st um, urging President Biden to stop opposing a lawsuit brought by kids to um, on constitutional grounds, um, making the point that the government support for fossil fuels is endangering their rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and that it's therefore unconstitutional. And um, if that ever reaches the court, the evidence of the government support for fossil fuels will be there for everybody to see. Right now, the administration is trying to block that um, lawsuit and prevent it from coming to trial. And so there will be a protest in front of the White House and um, several of us will be bringing our rocking chairs. I'm gonna take a moment while Gary, he's up the next question to find that article and put it in the chat for you. Okay, well, we've, we've got a question and a rejoinder. Um, the question is, are hybrids a cop-out or a good step for those who are considering making the change from gasoline to electric? She says she's seen folks say that hybrids are a stupid waste of time and that by now 100% electric is the way to go. There was an immediate response from Jim, who's on the call right now. He's got a plug-in hybrid and given that most of the trips we make are well within the battery range, he's currently averaging about 600, over 600 miles per gallon. So, you know, it's, it's working out really well for him. Um, thanks for both of those questions. If I understand them correctly, I agree with you. Uh, when I looked into it, I bought a plug-in electric and EV, a small Hyundai um, Kona. Um, I just thought from a personal point of view that, uh, as you probably know, the EVs are very, very low maintenance. And I thought, why do I want to have a gasoline engine and stuff could go wrong? I've owned a number of cars and gasoline engines need maintenance. So I just think from the maintenance point of view, also, you're not hauling around the weight of that engine, which you're not going to use very often, the gasoline engine. And that, so that makes space for uh, a larger um, battery. I was pretty disappointed recently when the Washington Post editorialized in favor of um, hybrids. Um, I thought that they were um, ill-informed and then they made the point at the end that, well, other countries have gone ahead with plug-in EVs at very high um, levels of adoption, but here in the United States, we have a different political situation. Well, that's a different argument. <laughs> To say that we don't have the political will to do this is one thing. To say that the hybrids are, are a good choice for consumers is another. That said, I have friends who have range anxiety. They like having that little gasoline engine um, on board. 
Um, I don't argue with them about it. I think it's better to get a hybrid than an EV. But if my friends ask me what they should do, I say, go straight for the EV. You're going to be happier with it. They're fun to drive. Um, they, they get great range. Um, some of them with a little bit of planning, you can go on long trips. So um, I'm mark me down as an EV, as an EV fan, a full EV fan. And by the way, I put the link to my article about the um, Youth v. Gov um, challenge. Um, for those who might not feel very comfortable with groups like Extinction Rebellion and Climate Defiance, I think that the uh, it's called Our Children's Trust. I link to them there. I think this is a wonderful group for older Americans to support. The uh, If you haven't seen the movie, Youth v. Gov, I've got the trailer in there or read the book, The 21. These kids are so brave. Um, they're giving up their childhood to spend time in the courthouse <laughs> um, arguing for their right to a livable planet. And as I share in that article, I went to Richmond to um, support them at a hearing that they held. You can see the picture there of the rally we held afterwards. And uh, when I asked, you know, can I shake your hands? I started to cry. I teared up because um, they are really, we shouldn't be asking 14 and 15 year olds to spend their time in court doing this, but but these kids do it. And I think that they are incredibly um, moving. And this is a small scrappy uh, NGO. The, the woman who founded it, um, Julia Olson, is just an amazing, I've never met her. She's an amazing woman. You can see her in the movie. She's like den mother to these kids. She's legally brilliant. Um, and um, they could use all the support that they can get. Okay, next question. Uh, in your book, do you talk about the health effects of climate change on older adults and other vulnerable populations? The public health community is very concerned about this issue. Was this from Cheryl? Yes. I might invite you, Cheryl, in a minute. I'll give my short answer and invite Cheryl to say a few words about that. You probably know more about it than I do. Um, certainly, there's more and more focus on the um, health effects of fossil fuels. Um, a lot of the dialogue that I'm familiar with is focused on marginalized people, black and brown people who tend to live close to the processing plants and the extraction sites and suffer disproportionately from um, asthma, emphysema, heart disease, cancer, all of those things. Um, I believe globally the estimate is that about 9 million people a year die from the effects of fossil fuel pollution. And so even if climate change weren't real, we should be winding down fossil fuels. Obviously, older people are also um, more strongly affected, especially by heat. Um, yep. Many uh, older people who live in poverty have a, a double burden. And I think that that's a, a concern. It's not something that I researched or wrote about, which is why I want to now turn to Cheryl. <laughs> and you probably know a lot more about this than I do. Well, and I don't want to take away from, you know, the attention that you're giving, but that's why I did put the uh, uh, the link of Dr. Aaron West, um, uh, or Dr. Aaron, I can't remember the last name, in terms of, um, hold on, let's see, Dr. Aaron Guest, um, who is a, 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 a an expert in public health. And it's, and you are actually right, Lawrence, you know, first of all, the extreme heat is so hard on older adults in the summertime. Uh, people are also losing their homes in terms of the floods uh, that are occurring and uh, the fires. Um, but you are absolutely correct in terms of the asthma and the allergic reactions to the um, polluted air. And, and in fact, I would just add uh, very briefly that there now is even a society of um, medical, uh, medical professions who are addressing this because physicians are seeing that more and more patients, older adult patients and other vulnerable um, uh, people are coming in with these issues that are uh, related to, um, to climate change. So it's more than just all these things we've been talking about, it's, it is really affecting our health too and our well-being. And so 
that is a real major concern, particularly for this population here that's on this program today and older adults generally. Is, is anybody on this call a member of AARP? I am. Um, I will try and find and put in the chat. Um, AARP has the largest circulation magazine in the country at 30 million. And they have been very, very reticent about climate change. They see it as controversial. And that's partly because they um, do business in states dominated by uh, parties that want to call it controversial. But there is a petition out there for AARP members and future members urging them to step up their um, coverage of climate. And there's been some good work done in California. Maybe you know there's an AARP bulletin, looks like a little newspaper run state by state, and then there's the national magazine. And in California, they were able to get AARP to um, include in their bulletin information about how seniors could use the funds in the Inflation Reduction Act to save money. And this is something ARP is very good at, sort of news you can use, um, how to take advantage of these incentives and um, subsidies. And so now there's now a group, Elders Climate Action in Virginia. People want to get um, involved. I'm happy to put you in touch with that. That is meeting with AARP people in Virginia to ask them to do the same. So there's the petition, which is national, and then there's state level actions to um, urge AARP. And I, I think part of what we want to do is in getting groups like AARP to start talking about climate change is to push aside the idea that this is somehow a controversial notion. It's not controversial, it's science, it's happening now. Um, one of the phrases that we often use in the climate movement is to change everything takes everybody. And AARP is gonna have to get on board as will uh, many other um, organizations. So I see Nancy says she'd like that. Um, uh, maybe while Gary talks, I'm gonna hunt around and see if I can find that. If I don't find it, um, I will send it to Liz maybe. And Liz, you could perhaps um, send it to the group afterwards. I posted a link to uh, Elders Climate Reaction uh, Virginia chapter. Is that what we're looking for? Um, the woman who runs that, Gloria Moog, is very involved in the Virginia effort. And so, yes, if you'd like to be involved locally with a with the effort to get AARP to talk about climate, that's a great place to, to, to start. Um, I'll say something interesting about this. They are a little bit below the radar with AARP in that we have found, they have found it's better for individual members to approach AARP than for a climate group. They'll shut down if it comes from a climate group. So what, what Elders Climate Action is doing is seeking members like people of this group um, who will uh, write to or call AARP in their individual capacity. Um, but the petition is, uh, I'm gonna, I'll try and find that petition and put it in the chat. That's, that's something you can sign on. Of course, like any petition, once you sign it, they got your information, you'll probably hear from them again. A comment here, Jane Fonda and her Red Fridays down at the Capitol were great until the pandemic reared its ugly head and shut that down. Do you know if she's planning to revive that or anybody else is going to take up that mantle? Um, I really admire Jane Fonda and her work. I've been to a couple of the um, Fire Drill Fridays um, some of you may know that her health isn't good. She's been fighting cancer. And um, mm -hmm. so uh, I don't know if she's going to be in a position to be involved. Obviously, I don't have any inside um, information about that. I think that the group that has taken up that mantle is Third Act, and she's very supportive of Third Act and sometimes appears on um, video calls with Third Act. But... Um, I don't know if she's, uh, she may well be, you know, <laughs> she's an amazing woman. She might get well enough to lead them again, but I know she's got some health challenges. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think I found a petition link, right, which I put in the chat. Uh, thank you, Steve. Um, I found 
uh, maybe they go to the same place. I found what looks like a slightly different uh, petition that's got, it's also, it's Elders Climate Action ARP. So either one of those would probably um, get you there. And I don't know, I mean, if you always have books, but something you might want to think about um, if you're not totally sick of climate would be getting somebody from Elders Climate Action to come and talk to this group because they have very local Virginia oriented activities. Of I could also get somebody from Third Act, but you sort of have somebody from Third Act here right now. So how are we doing on time, Gary, uh and questions? It's about three minutes to 11. <laughs> um, got a comment here. You know, we were going back and forth about EVs versus hybrids that uh, when people are talking about hybrids, they should distinguish plug-in hybrids from non-plug-in hybrids. Because if you've got a plug-in hybrid, you can, you know, top up the battery without firing up that little gas engine. And I think that's why Jim is getting such uh, spectacular gas mileage. I was going to mention that people should save the chat before they go because there's so many useful links in it. Yep. Yeah, and when we shut down, I'm not going to sign off right away. So anybody that wants to scroll through the chat and uh, copy anything down will have a few minutes to do so. I used to panic about saving the chat because I didn't know how. And I just found if I mouse up to the three dots in the upper right, right hand corner and click on that, it says save chat. I'm not sure where it went, but um, I was technologically challenged and I think I've learned how to save the chat. So um, if, if I might, Gary, I might read just the closing piece um, of my... Um, The closing bit of my book is a final word. Yeah, I think that would be a good way to close out. And I, I like to be respectful of people's times. I'm happy to stay on afterwards if people want to chat informally, but I also think it's nice to sort of bless and release people who have um, other things to do. Um, if if you're um, inspired about this, um, I hope you'll consider getting my book or ask Arlington County Library. To get you a copy. I'm trying to get it in the library. And if there were two or three requests, that might um, help. Also, if you belong to another group and you'd like to uh, invite me to speak in person um, or online, um, I wrote the book because I wanted to give talks like this to encourage people to become involved in the climate movement. And so... Um, Did you want to say something? Oh, is that... Yeah. yeah um... I just wanted to let you know that Arlington County Library has a special um, track for local artists, I'm sorry, local authors that you might want to ask them about. Diane said that she bought a copy of every book in that local author fair for the library, so it should be there. It might be in cataloging. Oh, that's valuable information, Steve and Liz. Um, thank you. This is Diane Kresh. Diane Kresh is the uh, the director of the Arlington um, Public Library. Oh, okay. I will follow up. That's um. I didn't know that when I participated in the author fair, they said that it would not necessarily mean that your book would get in the library, but maybe they were hedging maybe they were hedging their bets a little bit well it diane made the rounds and she just sort of announced it off the cuff so i think it's a sort of a typical diane thing i will <laughs> i will reach out to diane um patrick hope some of you may know is arlington's delegate to the um assembly in richmond and he's offered to hold a book event for me at arlington library and yeah. i've looked into it a little bit and the first thing you need to have is that your book is in their collection so um, um, I will reach out to Diane. Thank you for that information. Let me then close so that we can um, release people. Uh, this is the last couple sentences of my book. Mary Helger, an essayist and the host of the climate podcast Hot Takes, writes, no matter what your current skills are, there's a way to use them to support climate justice. Do what you are good at. If you can't do the work, 
care for people who can. And I mentioned before, giving money, cooking meals, looking after people's kids, um, various other ways to support. Her advice reminds me of two ancient Jewish teachings that are highly relevant to the situation we face today. The first states, you are not obliged to complete the work, but neither are you free to desist from it. And the second asks a question, if not now, when? Well said. Lawrence, I wanna thank you so much for your excellent presentation and answering all those questions. Lawrence McDonald, author of Am I Too Old to Save the Planet? A Boomer's Guide to Climate Action. Couldn't be more timely. Thank you so much for your excellent presentation. You got a lot of uh, applause uh, signs here. And so we really appreciate having you on the program. And I'm sure that folks will follow up at the library or Amazon or whatever and get a copy of your book. So. It's a little after 11, so just to remind Thank you for having me. And oh, thanks you're welcome. For the, thank you for the great work that um, uh, Arlington Village does in building community. It's incredibly important. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And to that point, uh, next week, there'll be another Coffee and Conversation. The title is Arlington History. There's an app for that. And our guest will be Peter Vasilopoulos, who is a digital storyteller and creator of the Arlington Historical App. And he's gonna be talking about um, his, his uh, did he, well, I just said it. So tune in next week and I'm sure Liz will provide some more information about that. So, and I guess according to our guest today, if you wanna stay on and ask him some questions, um, you can do so. And uh, Liz, thank you. Carolyn, um, thank you, Gary. Thank you for all for your good work and we'll see you next week.